epistemology. There's a lot of interest and discussion taking place as to what's going on at the base level, the very beginning. Now, Metasage has injected something really interesting into this, um, where he's um, using the term externalism or externalists. Now, it's kind of flipping solipsism on its head, where rather than saying there's nothing external to me, or that which perceives, um, the emphasis seems to be there's nothing except that which is exterior to that which perceives, because there's nothing in there that does perceive anything. Um, now, before we sort of ridicule this position as crazy, the scientific method is essentially <laughs> based on this, uh, which you know, a lot of people take the scientific method as gospel, so if you can't um, verify something by a third party, then we move on to something else. It's not that they're saying that it's it's wrong, but we have to sort of move on to something else. We have to just sort of say, okay, well, that's even if we've discovered something, we have no way of verifying it um, empirically, so what can we do with it? I'm not saying that science is quite that blind and dogmatic. If you look at, say, psychiatry or psychology, it doesn't work like that. But generally speaking, um, the emphasis is upon your ability to catalog things and study them from the outside. Um, you take an extreme case of this, um, and again, no jab intended here, uh, in Mendham, who would say, uh, he almost seems to imply that there is no I, and like, again, it's sort of flipping solipsism on its head. I doesn't exist, but everybody else exists. Everybody else's individual I exists, but yours doesn't. So, um, again, our ethical system kind of works that way, so lest we be too harsh on Inmendum for thinking this way. Uh, it's an interesting sort of shifting of emphasis, right, on the purely external to the purely internal. Um, which is which, and how do we decide? I come down, obviously, on the side of the internal, but not as dogmatically as, you know, as these diehard individualists would, you know, Ayn Rand libertarian type people. Um, but, in fact, I really don't agree with a lot of what they have to say. But it's still kind of in that camp, individual versus that which is external to that which perceives. Internal versus external, which is which. Um, Heidel Day has um, talked about this, banning the internal or whatever. Um, I don't know. Metasage has it pretty well um, cataloged, I guess, what that attitude is. A metasage seems to be somewhat hostile to that to the position of externalism, which again externalism could simply be the reverse of pure solipsism. Um, in which case, I guess I'm hostile to it as well, um, because I think that it's really got serious problems in it. Um, in as much as I'm still, I'm just as hostile, I guess, to pure solipsism because it just seems to me pretty obvious that something's taking place outside of me. I might not be able to identify what it is, but it seems bloody real, <laughs> you know. Um, I think that we have to strike some sort of balance between the internal and the external. It's not a question of which is right and which is wrong. Or not even balance, maybe even a synthesis. We have to understand which is which. Uh, and sort of reconcile them, or merge the two of them, really. Um, it's a very interesting discussion, and it goes down to the basic bare bones. And it's, in many ways, I guess, a lot of people would find it a slightly frightening discussion. Um, in the Indian way of looking at things, it is a frightening discussion. Um, because when you go inside, you often find things that you don't know were in there, and you don't really want them to be in there, but they is in there. It's kind of like um, gazing into that mirror. Are you really ready to do it? Are you really, really ready to look at the contents of what's inside your head? Um, 
or just look at yourself for what you really are. There's elements of like eternal recurrence of the same in there from Nietzsche. If you're going through every lifetime over and over again for all eternity, you're the same lifetime over and over again for all eternity, do you really want to know about this or do you want some sort of nepenthe to get you to forget that? Um, I don't know. It's... I guess it just depends on on how you see time existence, your own existence, things like this. Um, on another note, there's an interesting video that I don't know if anyone's likely to watch. Um, but it's an extremely rare gem about a bunch of uh, pundits from Kashmir. These are Hindus from the predominantly Muslim Indian state of Kashmir. Now, Kashmir has a really interesting place in Hinduism. Um, it developed some very interesting sort of, what do you call it, well, tantric uh, philosophies and practices where Tantra is trying to sort of fuse the internal and the external. Um, much of Hinduism is an escape from the external. Uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and the preponderance of Hinduism, I would say, work that way. Um, but Tantrism is trying to say, no, no, the external is just as important, at least from the position of a human being. It's a highly humanistic uh, philosophy, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and this video deals with a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, like the emergence of the I, the emergence of identity, or even what identity is, and what the processes are by which um, identity individual identity gets sort of, what you call it, um, emerges from the big one, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's a very well worked out philosophy, hard to follow. It's a kind of done in the, in the um, format of a round table discussion. It's a bunch of people sitting in somebody's living room discussing something. Now, this video is like one in a million um, because they deal with Indian subjects as Indian people but they're speaking in English <laughs> uh, this is rare this is extremely rare um, if you want to sort of get an, an interesting insight into how Indians see all of this if you're used to seeing Hinduism as sort of this kind of puerile um, masala film type pictures of many armed gods and stuff like that you're in for a bit of a surprise when you see this video uh, if you bother to watch it it's four hours long um, concerning um, a certain type of Indian epistemology um, or Eastern epistemology or whatever it's very well thought out. I won't even try to parse what they're saying or anything. I'm just throwing this video out there. I don't think anybody is going to see it, but you know, it might be good to have a gander at it if you're interested. If you think you can sit through four hours of it, I'm doing it. I'm doing it in pieces. It was very good. <laughs> I'll leave a link below. Um, and uh, it does sort of touch upon so many of the things that we're discussing here that I thought it would be useful to at least throw it out there. Um, a lot of people have, you know, indicated that they are interested in Indian epistemology and Indian metaphysics and even in Indian humanism. Um, and and it's interesting that that they arrive at a lot of conclusions that do seem mighty similar. I asked I asked um, Connor whether or not he'd studied Hegel and I'm sort of sort of studying it right now and something has kind of clicked in my head about his dialectic synthesis antithesis and, or sorry uh, thesis antithesis synthesis it kind of reminds me of Syadvada or the Saptabhangi the sevenfold um, theory of um, predication in some ways it is in some ways it isn't um I wonder, see, if these sort of quote-unquote truths that these philosophers come along with are universal, and they should be, or they ain't all that valid, 
you would think that different cultures would arrive at the same ideas through different means. And it's interesting to see something like, um, or to at least look at, um, the uh, Hegelian dialectic in the ter in, in terms of Anakantavada or Syadvada or the Saptabhangi. Um, really interesting, because that's what uh, thesis, synthesis, and antithesis, er, <laughs> tongue twister, thesis, antithesis, synthesis sort of do. You do switch perspectives, don't you? It's in Hegel's case, you switch perspectives over time, and in the Indian sense, you you just switch perspectives in the in the moment, uh, in a artificially and arbitrarily fixed point. You switch perspectives, but over at at the end, I find the result kind of similar. Um, and I was wondering if anyone else had made any connections. It's kind of a disjointed video I've just made, but uh, I guess I've just got too many things going on <laughs> right now <laughs> that I'm thinking about. Um, but I really love stuff like this. Uh, epistemology. Uh, the bare bones of it all. Um, I'm glad that somebody or somebody's generated this discussion. <laughs>